see things are growing here at Dirt Lifestyle HQ. I've hired my first employee. I mean, first off, things were growing with the Samurai. I mean, I, I was not planning on a Samurai build, but I just couldn't say no. The Samurai was built on TV and on one of my favorite shows, and it was uh, one of my favorite builds. And so when I had the opportunity to buy it, I just could not say no. I didn't have it in me. And now we're in a position where I need help. And so I have hired my first full-time employee, my friend Matt, and um, he's going to be working full-time for us at least through SEMA, and then we will see what happens from there. I would like to open up an off-road shop, and then that means more hiring. <laughs> so we're going to see where this path takes us. This is a really big leap, and it's scary and all that other stuff, but right now, we're just going to focus on the work. We're going to get this Suzuki Samurai to the Power Stop Brake booth and show up at SEMA with something I can be proud of. I really want to keep the weight down on this Samurai. And so for that reason, we're going to go super minimalist on this front winch plate. I've never built anything like this, but it's just bare minimal material. I'm gonna put a giant relief in the winch plate itself to give me this really big pass-through for the winch line. And because I'm doing that, um, I'm going to put a super smooth and polished out beveled edge on this pass-through to make sure that if the rope ever did like lay across it while I was loading the front suspension with the winch, it's not gonna cut the rope. This new face is my friend Matt. He is my first employee, which I'm super excited about. Me too. And uh, I will put his social media stuff down so you can follow him. And him and I are going to try to tackle this SEMA Samurai build in the next, what, how many weeks did you say we have? Like, we got like six weeks, seven weeks. Not enough weeks. Right now, Matt is tackling, finishing up our slider, and I am trying to work on this front bumper. It's funny how this is such a tiny winch. This is a competition winch, but once you put it in front of that tiny samurai grill that I narrowed, it sure eats up all that real estate. I, I'm trying to figure this out. Right now, I've just got it sitting in there so I can see what I like and don't like. I feel like it needs to go down. So I'm gonna figure out a way to take this winch plate and drop it down a little bit and see if that makes a difference in the way it looks. In these sliders, I want to keep things super simple. And so when Matt and I talked about it, I, what I voiced is that I want them to flow, so we might use some little like trim piece on the back to make them flow nice. But all in all, these are a tool. These are something that you're going to bash into things. They need to be strong. We don't want to go crazy with tube because you just start adding a whole bunch of dead weight to make things look good. And as far as the front bumper is concerned, it's kind of the same thought process. I want to, I want this to have tube and I want it to have a good look, but at the end of the day, this needs to be the least amount of tube possible because I want this to be a high performance vehicle and we need to keep the weight down wherever we can. I've been having a really hard time deciding on a look for the front of the Samurai. I've combed through tons and tons of pictures of like buggy front bumpers and Samurai front bumpers and nothing really stuck out as what would be applicable to this situation. You know, we have a narrowed grill and all that. And after toying around with a couple of different ideas and even fabbing up a couple different pieces, 
I decided that an old school mini stinger was going to meet the personality of this thing the best. And it just looks so much more samurai to me. I think that this is going to be the right route. This is the first piece of tube that I've put on here in this front end design that actually got me excited. And so we'll do a stinger. We'll connect it with a couple of little stickers on the side. And uh, it should be really strong. It should look good. And it's going to not be a lot of tubes, so it's going to stay lightweight. This is my friend Ryan. Ryan has some experience doing lathe work, probably with much nicer equipment than this. And I got this Harbor Freight lathe. I have a project, my first lathe project, which should be very easy with my steering setup. And so Ryan's over here. He's gonna help me figure out what I need to buy or if we can do this today and turn on the lathe and try to, I don't know, take a couple thou off of this. Um, We'll see. So now we're just going to play with this for a little bit and see if we can get a game plan for my steering setup. I have something going on in my head. I just need to put it in reality. A metal lathe is something that I have been wanting to buy forever. But I, if you've ever looked at any of this machining equipment, you can go so mild to wild. I don't want to invest in a really big high, you know, what I think is a high quality machine. And then it turns out to be crap. And I, if I knew any lathe basics, perhaps I would know to steer away from that. So what I'm trying to do is learn this skill set on a bench top mini lathe. I got this one from Harbor Freight. Um, there is, um, there are a million accessories for this thing online. So the reason I'm bringing Ryan over is that he's got lathe experience. He understands all the nuance, like how fast of a speed should I be turning? Um, you know, how many thousands of an inch should I be trying to take off at once? Just, I want to have a little bit of comfort with learning from a friend before I just fire up the machine and just start trying to do stuff. Um, tooling, machining tooling specifically can be dangerous. And if you have access to someone that has any experience, sometimes it's nice to just catch up with an old friend anyway, and then play around with this new equipment. And now, after messing around with this for a little bit and turning our first piece of steel out of it, I've got an idea of what accessories to buy so that hopefully next week I can turn down some material and build my own inexpensive steering column for the Samurai build. I completely guessed a length on these front frame rails when I built them into the Samurai a few episodes back, and it turns out I'm only like one or two inches long to mount these tube clevis mounts. So I'm going to start by chopping this down a little bit just to just keep things nice and tidy looking, uh, weld these in, and then the front will completely match the way the back of the Samurai came whenever I got it. While I'm working on this front end, I've had Matt working his way through each one of these cage tie-ins. They're very important for a number of reasons. One, I want to add as much structural rigidity this, to this as possible, and these cage tie-ins are something that you can unbolt, which is nice, but it's something that's going to be able to add rigidity and structure to make it to where this actually does for, function like a buggy, but it also gives us a way to shore up each leg of the cage to make sure that whenever you roll over, it doesn't have some weak point in the body that the cage just blows through. And this is gonna be able to help transfer the energy from the cage in a rollover scenario, from the cage down into the frame itself. Let's have a look. 
So it's actually not as crazy as uh, like this fits in there no problem. Like, oh wow. Like if you do that, so if we eliminated that bolt, I think we can make that work. And again, with a carrier bearing, that's not that crazy. No, it's gonna go like right here. And this is a flange, so it's like I would have a flange to you join adapter here. And, God, that's so close to the engine. <laughs> you could rotate the pinion down a little bit though. That's true, to get that if out. I had to. But I mean, it, it's like not even, this is two inch piece too, you could build one out an inch and a half. It is a normal size drive shaft. So it'd still be carrier bearing, but oh, but again though, if I cut this, well. I don't know if it's worth the time. Really? Because carrier bearing, if we cheated as far driver as we could, you're gonna be right here, right? Because usually you mount yeah. the carrier bearing even with yeah, your front link. Yeah, that, that's where I was. I was thinking somewhere with the, around the front link for sure. Even if you were just in line with the, definitely getting close. But I'm at the point in this build where we have to order some very expensive hard parts and make some really big decisions. And uh, drive shaft stuff is something that I know will be a struggle all the way to the very end. But I think we have a pretty clear path. Now we need to order some coilovers, um, and this is a big expensive very important thing to not get wrong. Matt brought this really cool thing, which I haven't seen before. Actually, I think I have seen them. I just have never, I've never used one. This is like a pre-compressed measurement for 14 inch, 16 inch, and 18 inch shocks. And so we're using this to kind of eyeball a good way to orient and mount the uh, the front coilovers so that we can order these ASAP. I mean, there's been, the last few years, there's been crazy lead times on coilovers. I heard it's getting better, but we won't know until we get some measurements and we can actually order what we need. So we're sticking this in here. We're trying to figure out, we want to get the longest coilover possible in here. I think that we've got a pretty good, I, it could be worse. <laughs> there's lots of space in here right now and I think that we can make something work that's gonna be pretty sweet. I have been getting quite a few questions about this Rogue Fab Versa Notcher. They sent this out to us a few months ago. I have been using it in the shop a whole bunch. Um, my last notcher fell apart. I, I've only used like inexpensive notchers like many of you watching, I'm sure. Like stuff that's really affordable, Harbor Freight, Amazon, that kind of thing. And to go from that to this, this, <laughs> this Rogue Fab Notcher, is insane it's like using a completely different tool and that's because it is this is obviously something that they designed from scratch because it's unlike anything else in the market there's a couple of cons but let's just start with the pros big pro this thing sets up extremely fast it um, also gives me the flexibility of doing extreme angles uh, which i couldn't do with any of the other notchers that i've owned in the past um, it also has the ability to offset notch, which I haven't seen in very many other notchers. I can't, in fact, off the top of my head, I can't think of another notcher that offsets tube together like this one does, especially in its price range. Now, for like almost 500 bucks, you might think that's really expensive when you look at like the Harbor Freight notchers being like 80 bucks, but 500 bucks is about middle of the road. There are plenty of notchers over a thousand and there's you know plenty of notchers under a hundred. So $500 is kind of like middle of the road price range. And this can literally do everything. I haven't seen another notcher that does more than this one does. So that's the positive. The negatives, one would just be the price. It's not $80. So if you're looking for extreme budgets and extreme, extreme budget savings, I should say, this is probably not the notcher for you, but if you're the kind of person that likes to save up for the right tool that is like a lifetime tool, this is definitely where it's at. The other thing is square stuff does not lock in this very well, which is not a big deal. For most square stuff, I just use a uh, drill press and a hole saw, but that's something that should be noted because there are other notchers out there that will do square really well. And because of the way this is put together, it's a little bit more difficult to chuck square into it. And then the uh, the size limitations limit out for square at about an inch and three quarter. I can't get anything square into it that's bigger than an inch and three quarter. All in all, this has saved us a ton of time in the shop. I love how little play and chatter there is in it. And this is a, this is a unit that I absolutely would endorse and recommend to anybody that's in the market for one.
Now it's time to get back to work, and I'm going to start with figuring out how to mount this radiator and exactly where I'm going to mount this radiator, because once I start to put some of these really important pieces in the engine bay, we can start to build out like coilover mounts, and there's just so much stuff that has to go in here, so might as well get started on it now. This cross member is the radiator mount, and because we have holes in the top, there's no doubt in my mind that eventually lots of water and mud and moisture and stuff was gonna work away in there. So <laughs> it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra holes, but now I can actually paint in every nook and cranny of the inside, and then as water gets in and out, it's very easy for it to get back out. So I know this looks a little goofy, and it's probably an extra step for a lot of people but I think this is really important because this is gonna be my long-term rock crawler. While I'm buttoning up this radiator mount on the front of the rig, Matt is at the back of the rig reworking the cross member setup. Now, I've already removed almost every cross member. There's only two of the original cross members left in here, and Matt is about to cut and move one of them. And this is just the reality whenever you're taking somebody else's project and you're making huge changes like this, there's just gonna be a lot of things that need to be reshaped and reworked to make to make sense for the new chassis design. And in this instance, we wanted these cage tie-ins to flow through and meet at a cross member instead of in between cross members, and then we added a little bit of triangulation, and that's pretty much it. I'm so glad that worked so well. It, it fits in there like a Cherokee radiator going into a Cherokee. And that's exactly what I'm trying to put together here. I don't want to put some awesome aftermarket radiator in here that I have to go find another rare, awesome aftermarket radiator to replace it. This is the exact dimension. This is made to go into a Cherokee. It's just aluminum and fancy. So if I have an issue on a long trip, I can go get a Cherokee radiator drop it right in place here and we're good to go. Now the next thing is I need to I need to do a bunch of things all in one shot. So what I'm thinking here, this is what I came up with. We need to mount this radiator. I want to shore up this bar that is going to locate our headlights and our or, and our grill. And I really need to start adding some crossover beef from this, we'll just call it a fender, from one fender to the other. So what I'm thinking is to kill three birds with one stone, I would take this inch and a half tube, we would locate the radiator where we want it, put a little bend in it, mount it into this inch and three quarter, that inch and three quarter, and then we can attach the radiator to it. And then I can build like a really nice, fancy dimple die reveal, like special plate that we'd weld onto the front here to anchor it to this other piece of angle. That'll really help make this more rigid side to side. And then as we build out these like coilover mounts and stuff, it's just gonna keep getting better. The problem that I see is the same problem that I was concerned about with this, uh, with this lower cross member. We put all those holes in there to make sure that I could not only paint inside of it, knowing that water will get in there, but it allows water and mud and stuff to easily get out. This is not, we don't have the same flexibility with this tube, but if I just drill and tap a hole into the tube, which is very easy and very fast, now, it, this mounts, but it's definitely going to get water in it, and it's just going to settle where we're going to bend this down, and that's going to be a problem. It's going to fill with water. It's going to freeze. We're going to start to see rust and stuff come out of the welds. Obviously, that destroys the structural integrity, so I see an opportunity. We could just go to a bunch of hardware stores and try to find a, a sleeve that we could weld in there, but we just ordered all that stuff for the lathe. It should be here tomorrow or the day after. What I'm thinking is that we use this as an opportunity to try to learn that equipment a little bit better. So if we took some of that three quarter inch bar stock back there, I did not plan this. This is just problem solving in real time. What I'm thinking is we cut that bar stock to the right length, we throw it into that lathe, we drill, we bore it out because remember it's like, you know, it spins. So we should theoretically be able to just throw a drill bit at it, bore it out and then tap it quarter 20 and now we have a custom sleeve to go through here 
because we're gonna weld it in, it'll keep the water out and it's gonna give us a super solid anchor point for this radiator. So for now, until all that stuff shows up, I thought it might be here tomorrow, we'll see. Until all that stuff shows up, I'm gonna throw a little bend in this side, a little bend in that side. We can start to like tack some things in and then we can lay out for some kind of a cool like dimple die reveal plate in the front here. Matt is off work. It's officially the weekend, but my buddy Nick came over to give me a hand and it was very time consuming, but between the two of us, we were able to work our way through building this dimple die reveal. And again, this has some structural benefits. It's gonna be super light because of its design, but it's also just gonna add huge looks to this, which is so important for a SEMA build. I want this to look amazing, whether you're looking under it, over it, next to it, or if you pop the hood and check out the engine bay. months back I upgraded the TIG Torch setup for my Miller Multimatic ACDC and this has been a game changer for me. Being able to easily adjust the torch head has been amazing. Um, I've got a radiator now and it actually pumps coolant through the TIG Torch itself uh, keeping everything nice and cool so I can weld as long as I want to and not have to let the TIG Torch cool down like I did before. Between this new setup and now I TIG torch with glasses on instead of just using my contacts, my TIG welds, they're, they're slightly better, but my ability to keep the tungsten out of the, uh, out of the puddle is so much better than it used to be. My control is so much better than it used to be. And um, I just am so much more comfortable as a TIG welder now that I have a little bit more advanced setup. This dimple dyed plate that I put up here not only added some structural integrity, and we'll, you'll see why in the near future when we start mounting like radiators for our intercooler and stuff like that, um, but it also added great looks. It was super, super light because we pulled so much material out of it, and um, now I think that it just looks awesome under there. You can see it when the hood's closed just a little bit. You can really see it when the hood's open. And there will be times where I'm going to strip most of the body off of this thing if I'm doing uh, hardcore enough trails where I'll pull the hood, I'll pull the windshield frame, I'll pull the doors and the soft top because this is a buggy. Most of the time I'll be able to leave all that stuff on here, but if I decide to go down some trails where I might put this thing on its side, it's kind of cool that whenever you pull all that stuff off, it still looks good and you can tell that it's a, it's a buggy under there. All these goodies finally showed up for the lathe and now I'm ready to work. So I've got a table full of little parts and pieces, some tooling, I'm gonna experiment. That's what today's gonna all be about for me. Uh, the first thing I need to do is cut some sort of a base to mount this onto, because apparently that makes a big difference in the rigidity of the deck ways. I don't know, I'm learning all the terminology, but in any case, we're supposed to be able to get a lot better product out of this machine if we anchor it to something super solid. I'm not planning on mounting this lathe into this toolbox. What I wanna do is mount it to a 3 8 by six inch wide piece of steel. This is gonna be a really nice, heavy, rigid anchor to mount this to, uh, making it to where there's gonna be much less flex and whatnot in the equipment itself. Um, I'm gonna need to go to the hardware store and grab some hardware and whatnot, but while I'm doing that, Matt is here working. This is one of the benefits of hiring somebody, and he is working on the coilover mounts. And what I expressed to him is that I wanted to see 180s. I like to use 180s whenever I can, just because they look so good. Um, and we have the, the ability to do that with the dies that we have. So Matt is going to spend a lot of time trying to notch and place uh, these 180 pieces of inch and three quarter tube to make it to where we have, whenever we go to mount these coilovers, this is gonna give us a ton of flexibility as to where we need to mount these. And it's just gonna match this overall like tube buggy feel that we've got going on with the Samurai. A 
four jaw chuck is supposed to be a giant upgrade for this lathe, but the one that I ordered will not fit. Um, but that's not gonna stop us from working. Just something I'm gonna have to upgrade later. This three quarter rod doesn't quite fit in a three quarter hole. Uh, but the piece that we machined with Ryan when he came over last week, um, that fits in there perfect. So obviously we're going to have to just turn down these sleeves a little bit in order to get them to drop in the way we want to. But the good thing is if we leave a little shoulder on top, that should help keep them from falling through whenever I TIG weld this and we're all done. Low speed power is definitely a limitation of this machine and I could feel it struggling pretty hard to tap this hole. So I was able to very easily just twist it by hand and uh, tap it, use the machine to help me a little bit here and there, but for the most part, I just kind of hand tap this and then it was time to turn it down and then uh, drop it in and see how it fits. I came up with an idea for a very simple steering column last winter that I didn't have the tooling to do yet. Now, we've already got the lathe out, so this is like kind of the perfect time to, to push to the next project. We've already done some very simple lathe work. Now we're gonna just kind of up it a little bit more. I want to build a mounting flange. I want to use the lathe to center a mounting flange. And then we're also gonna use the lathe to uh, to use it as like a fixture so we can TIG weld a mounting flange to some 3 8 rod. <laughs> I think that, and then we're going to also use that to turn down the outside of the flange because I don't have a way of making the perfect size circle outside of using this lathe. So we're going to experiment with a whole bunch of techniques. Um, I did buy a steady rest to try to make this an easier project. And the one that I bought didn't fit. There's a lot of different size lathes out there, so it's just gonna go back on the list of things I need to order. But I'm gonna try to do this with the tooling that we have here. And I think that we can get this done. And the cool thing is, as far as material costs, this should only be like a few dollars worth of steel and we should end up with something pretty cool. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Um, this feels like a good place to be. This is, uh, I chose this drifting steering wheel, a little bit deeper dish, just because I felt like it's going to go with the spirit of how we're going to style this. Uh, very likely getting a wrap. Um, and I just want this to be so JDM with the JDM front grill, the JDM hood, well, Malaysian hood. Everything seems like it's fitting okay. Um, I do see potential. I mean, I mean, I'm close to that, but I don't know if it's gonna actually hit. I could easily cut this down and just have the ball be just slightly down. But where I'm sitting right now is very comfortable. I think the seat's all the way back, right? Yep. Yeah, so this is as far back as Nate gets to sit. There's like, <laughs> it's a samurai. <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Once there's pedals in here, you know, there's gonna be moments where it's gonna feel tight. That's for sure. But, that's just the, that's the price you pay when you're trying to go small and light like this. 
What do you think about that? I've never seen it, uh, like homemade steering column, but I wanted to do something a little original. And with that inexpensive lathe, you know, that lathe, it opens up a whole bunch of different possibilities. So, and, ooh, hold this for me, Matt. Once I get this like secured and fastened the way I want to, this will be my theft deterrent, which is, you know, super tuner kid, but most of the time, this is just gonna be trailered somewhere, but when I go to Moab, most people take their buggies to Moab, you'll drive it out to dinner and all that stuff, and if I'm going into a Mexican restaurant to hang out with friends, it would be nice to bring a steering wheel with me. All right, nice, it clicked right in there. A couple of little things to work out. The I machined a little shoulder into this, and it does work, but it's not so much shoulder. It, I just didn't have enough material work to work with to give me the shoulder I wanted. Where like right here is right on the shoulder, but if I push in, then I can get that shoulder to kind of fit down in there. So that's something I'm gonna figure out. I'll probably just get like a, a bronze bushing material to just kind of pick up that slop and run it like right up to the same edge as that shoulder. And then, once this is all welded up and we're doing our final assembly, I have a little grease zerk. I'll show you. I've got this little grease zerk here. And the whole point is, you know, there's no reason why this would wear. It's not like it's spinning, like it's not a tire, right? Um, but I don't want it to eventually like squeak and stuff. So I'm thinking I could pump a little white lithium grease, some sort of a grease that doesn't smell like sulfur, pump that into here. And then I have no reason to believe that this is gonna be like, a wearable item. I think that this is probably gonna work out just fine. I feel like Matt and I have had a very productive couple of weeks on this Samurai. But before we go, I wanna try and tackle something as quickly as possible um, just to take advantage of half a day. And that is trying to cut out our firewall and mock it up in a way that we can fit the right pedal assembly for this Samurai. The factory pedal assembly just would not work for a number of reasons. And so we have to mock up something that's gonna be able to fit me and be able to fit the different odds and ends that we need to support our brakes and our hydraulic clutch and our electric throttle and all that. steering wheel, pedals, all very exciting stuff. This is a booster from a Jeep TJ. This is the clutch master from a Jeep TJ. And then uh, this is the uh, master cylinder, the brake master cylinder for I think a 2001 Dodge Ram. And the whole reason I decided to do all that is I've done a lot of research Everybody that I talk to that is one ton swapped a Jeep TJ has no issues with braking power. Um, if anything, they will put a bigger master on it to make sure that it moves enough fluid to stop one ton brakes. We're gonna have one ton brakes on this. So this is drilled out to eight on 6.5 and uh, we're, they're gonna be big brakes that are gonna take a lot of fluid. The little pedal assembly that was on the, for the Samurai was literally not one component of it would work with our new drivetrain. This is a Jeep TJ transmission, so that's why I wanted to do the Jeep TJ um, clutch setup, just because it's made to work together. We do have 
a pretty cool little aftermarket doodad that I think is going to make this a little easier. This is like a universal line that is made to go to the Jeep from the Jeep TJ Clutch Master to the Jeep TJ Clutch Slave. And the reason I did that is because the factory lines in the TJ are shaped to go right around the TJ firewall and our firewall, this is gonna be doing all kinds of funky stuff. As you can see, we do have an issue, not a big deal. So we're gonna probably shrink down the shock mounts to get out of the way of this master cylinder. Oh, and I don't know if I actually made very, very, very clear. This is a Jeep TJ pedal assembly. So when you use Jeep stuff for, for things like this, it's so much easier to find replacement parts if you ever need it. And that's why I prefer to do it that way. So the Samurai was drive-by throttle cable. This engine is drive-by wire. The Samurai, there's no, I looked everywhere. There is no like brake master cylinder, brake booster upgrades that just bolt right in. And then the Samurai also had a, uh, a wire or a, a cable clutch instead of a hydraulic clutch. So that's why we had to reinvent the wheel here. But now that we're at this point, I'm very confident that we're making the right decision. Everything is packaging in there the way it should be. And we've got a little bit of tweaking to do. I am super pumped about the progress we made on the Samurai. And at the last minute, the uh, competition hookless fair lead showed up from Yankum Ropes. We do sell these on our website if you're looking for a reason to support the channel. But it was nice to be able to swap out the traditional size out for the competition size. And it just looks so good up there. It's, it's kind of the, the cherry on top. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.